Erin, I'm so excited to talk with you about third-party candidates because I find them really interesting and I feel like we don't always have space for them on the campaign moment. And I was really curious because I know you've followed a lot of presidential campaigns. Do you have a favorite third-party candidate from, from all time? I mean, I don't know about a favorite, but my fascination with this traces back more than 30 years. Whoa. When I was in, I guess it would have been elementary school, our teacher asked us who we wanted to support in the 1992 election. Aww. And I definitely lined up behind Ross Perot at that moment. I don't think I knew anything about his policies, but <laughs> I was I was third party or die at that. You were like, I'm an iconoclast. I'm not going to do the major parties. <laughs> I, I mean... People accuse journalists of being contrarians, and I think that that was ingrained in me it. at a very young age. Welcome to the Campaign Moment from The Washington Post. It's Tuesday, August 27th. I'm Aaron Blake, senior political reporter here at The Post and writer of the Campaign Moment newsletter. And I'm Laura Benshoff, producer of the Campaign Moment podcast. Laura's here to help me unpack some of my more recent reporting and analysis about third-party candidates in the 2024 race. Of course, we just got a big development on that front with Robert F. Kennedy Jr., who was running as an independent, announcing that he is going to suspend his campaign. And I just wanted to take a moment to reflect on the winding path that brought us here and also on what his withdrawal means for the race moving forward. Plus, why there's a reason to believe it could help Donald Trump retake the White House, at least somewhat? Yeah, that's a big question I've had, Aaron. And I know a lot of people have had is just how did his candidacy and third party candidates overall, how did they affect the outcome of the race? And, you know, according to your analysis, these candidates are now hurting Kamala Harris more than Donald Trump. Yeah, I want to talk about that. But I wanted to start first with what happened with his actual announcement on Friday, because it was unusual. Here's what Kennedy said when announcing his suspension of his campaign. And just a heads up, if you're not familiar with Kennedy's voice, he has a condition called spasmodic dysphonia, which causes muscle spasms around his vocal cords. Oh, I want everyone to know that I am not terminating my campaign. I am simply suspending it and not, not ending it. My name will remain on the ballot in most states. If you live in a blue state, you can vote for me without harming or helping President Trump or, or, or Vice President Harris. In red states, the same will apply. I encourage you to vote for me. So basically, Kennedy is saying that he's not running anymore, but he's still technically going to be a candidate in most of the states, but not in a way that's going to actually influence the head-to-head matchup between Kamala Harris and Donald Trump. Right. But then he endorsed Donald Trump, saying they share many of the same causes, like free speech and, quote, breaking our addiction to war, unquote. And these are the principal causes that persuaded me to leave the Democratic Democratic Party and, and run as an independent. And now to throw my support to President Trump. Aaron, What does this mean? Okay, he's suspending but not terminating. Is that a meaningful distinction? What's going on in this announcement? Well, candidates will often suspend their campaigns rather than terminate them. This allows them to do certain things as far as retiring debt or returning contributions or, you know, kind of leaves the door open to potentially reentering the race at a later date. Um, This one is different, though, because he's basically saying he wants people to vote for him where he is on the ballot. And actually, he floated a rather unusual circumstance in which he could somehow still become president. Basically, he floated an idea that Harris and Trump could ultimately be tied at 269 electoral votes, in which case, at that point, the House would take over electing the president because there is no outright winner. Okay. And each state gets one vote. So the delegation from that state would combine to cast one vote for each state. The winner of the most states is elected president. Kennedy is basically suggesting that he could be the one who emerges from that process somehow. 
But the experts that I talked to noted that in order even to be considered in that scenario, you actually have to get an electoral vote of some kind. And that seems pretty far-fetched for Kennedy because he doesn't look like he's in contention to win any states. He doesn't look like he's in contention to win an electoral vote in one of the states that allots them by congressional district. So even this theory that he floated in announcing his withdrawal and his support for Trump on Friday doesn't appear to be something that's actually on the table. Right. And just to be clear, a candidate needs 270 electoral college votes. So in his mind, if there's a case where it's so close, there isn't a clear winner. If he gets any, he would be in contention. Yeah, I mean, that's the idea. I I, I don't it's weird that he even talked about this because it seems so (laughs) unlikely, you know, even if he were somehow eligible in that scenario, uh, the idea that the House would would go past Harris and Trump, who actually won a lot of electoral votes, is hard to believe. So it's a window into some of the kind of wackiness that we've seen from the Kennedy campaign throughout this election. Right. And I think it's probably fair to say with everything you've just shared is that it's it's an unlikely outcome. But him talking about it in this way also points to a dynamic that's been at play just throughout Kennedy's candidacy, which is this idea that him being in the race could really help or hurt one of the major party candidates in a close race. And I think it would be helpful just to kind of go back and take a a brief overview of his campaign so we can just kind of understand how he's functioned throughout the last, you know, many months of this campaign and and just understand a little bit about who he is. So Robert F. Kennedy Jr. is the son of Robert F. Kennedy, who, of course, was United States Attorney General and before that a senator from New York. He was assassinated in June of 1968. He is the nephew of former President John F. Kennedy and former Senator Ted Kennedy. Um, He's a member of the very famous political dynasty in America, but he's not somebody who ran for office um, until this campaign. Hmm. He comes from a pretty traditional Kennedy background in a lot of ways. You know, he was an assistant district attorney in New York. Later in his career, he made his name really as an environmental lawyer. Over the last 20 years or so, we've seen something of a shift. Um, He's actually taken on a new cause that maybe is the one he's most well known for, which is vaccine skepticism, which he pitches as being about defending children's health. Mm. After flirting with other runs in, in New York State, where he's from, he launched a Democratic primary campaign against President Biden last year. Almost instantly, we saw Trump allies begin promoting him. They, uh, Steve Bannon was was hosting him on his show a lot when he was a Democratic primary candidate. Fox News had oodles of stories about Robert F. Kennedy Jr. They clearly wanted him to take a chunk out of Biden's vote totals. But then last October, Kennedy decided that he was going to drop out of the Democratic primary and instead run as an independent, which created a whole host of new dynamics in this race that the parties have been reckoning with ever since then. And why did he why did he do that, Aaron? What was the thinking behind, Okay, I'm going to switch. I'm not a Democrat anymore. I need to be an independent. I mean, it was pretty clear at that point that he was not getting as much traction as he would have liked to in the Democratic primary. It's also very difficult to beat an incumbent president in a primary. I mean, he wasn't getting very close. He was taking a significant chunk of the vote, but it wasn't a huge amount. And so, you know, running as an independent gave him an avenue to perhaps have more impact on the race and continue this race after the primaries were over. Got it. Okay. No, that's interesting. Ever since he became an independent, and especially since this campaign kind of kicked into gear, he's been plagued by a lot of bad publicity, a number of stories in particular related to animals. Uh, Here's a brief overview of some of those stories with clips from CBS News, NPR, and News Nation with Chris Cuomo. RFK Jr.'s presidential campaign is responding to new reporting that he suffered memory loss due to a parasitic worm in his brain. A black bear killed nearly 10 years ago has been making political headlines. Presidential candidate Robert F. Kennedy Jr. admitted to dumping the dead bear cub in New York City's Central Park and making it look like a bicyclist had hit the animal. You know, they did this story that I ate a dog. And Mm -hmm. they have a picture of me supposedly eating a dog. And uh, of course, it's not a dog. 
We obviously don't have time to go unpack each of those headlines, but they were out there. People were talking about RFK Jr. having a brain worm and stuff like that. <laughs> it, it is, it, it's been a remarkable few months in this campaign. It really has been. And it's kind of easy to caricature a candidate, but this is a guy with a lot of skeletons in his closet from his earlier life. You know, he was somebody who was a drug addict. He was arrested. He obviously has a colorful personal life. There's, uh, you know, reporting about affairs and things like that. But also, you know, this is a guy who, at least for a time in this race, was polling better than any third-party candidate since Ross Perot in the 1990s. Hmm. Perot was the most formidable independent candidate we've had in the last several decades. He took 19% in the 1992 election and then 8% in the 1996 election. It's not clear that that necessarily impacted the outcome, but it showed kind of the appetite that could exist for a third-party candidate. I think people like the idea of the Kennedys. They're a popular political family. There was always a big question about how much this would last because I think a lot of it owed to malaise about these two president and former presidents who were running again, who people knew and didn't particularly like. And that created an opening for a third party candidate to gain support. And so I think those things really combined to create a little bit of a mirage about how formidable a candidate he was. My favorite story about this is that while I was writing about Robert F. Kennedy Jr.'s initial momentum in the in the race, I noticed that back in 2017, there was a Senate special election in Alabama, and there was a candidate in the Democratic primary named Robert Kennedy Jr. Huh. Uh, he was not a member of the Kennedy family, but he had that name. And there was a late poll in the Democratic primary that actually showed him winning half of the Democratic primary vote. He was 20 points ahead of the National Party's favored candidate in that race, Doug Jones, who actually wound up winning the primary and winning the Senate race. But I think that just speaks to like how much this name can mean at a time when people aren't paying attention. And I think it created an expectation that maybe wasn't, uh, wasn't easy for Robert F. Kennedy Jr. to fulfill as the race went along. Right. So if I hear you correctly, the Kennedy last name is just by itself a huge boost for it. any candidate, it sounds like. Yeah, and it certainly proved to be that. I think as the race went on, it became clear that this was indeed something of a mirage. He saw his support drop from 20 percent and then he kind of steadily mm. fell away where he was taking just about 5 percent in the average of the most recent polls. Super interesting. Okay, let's take a quick break. And when we come back, we're going to get into whether Kennedy's endorsement of Trump will help the Republican candidate and also how the other third party candidates are polling. We'll be right back. Okay, Aaron, now that we've set all of this up, I want to get into the numbers. You wrote this week that RFK Jr. exiting the race might help Donald Trump. Walk me through your analysis. How did you get there? Yeah, I think it's worth noting that we don't know a whole lot, but we do have a sense for where his support was coming from. And that support was increasingly coming from Republican-leaning voters. Early in the race, he was a candidate that Democrats were very concerned about. So the Democratic National Committee set up a whole operation to combat him. And I think the real turning point on that front is Kamala Harris getting into the race. Suddenly, these Democratic-leading voters who were unhappy with Biden or didn't see him as a, a great option were going for Harris. There wasn't this kind of opening that existed for Kennedy because people disliked both of the candidates. So basically what you're saying is Democrats who were just disillusioned with Biden and were thinking about voting for Kennedy— once Biden stepped aside and said he wasn't running, they're comfortable switching their allegiance to Harris. They're moving from Kennedy to Harris. Yeah, and we saw this a lot with young voters especially, but also Black and Hispanic voters to some extent. Those voters really came home for Harris. And so a few weeks back, I looked at the polls and you know saw a significant gap here. If you looked at the polls, 
that just had Harris and Trump against the polls that had all of these third party and independent candidates, Harris consistently did better in the crowded field. So the third party effect was actually helping her. Hmm. And the reason for that is that Robert F. Kennedy Jr. was clearly pulling more from Trump, was clearly pulling more from Republican leaning voters. There was a New York Times Siena College poll that showed his voters, if they were asked to choose between Trump and Harris, picked Trump by a 50 to 21 margin. Another poll showed him getting 23 percent of Republican leaning independents compared to just 8 percent of Democratic leaning ones. 23 percent is a really big chunk of voters. And so this is something that clearly was a liability for Trump. And that's what makes this a potentially significant development. You know, he wasn't taking a huge chunk of the votes, but our elections are decided by very small chunks of votes. So if this gives Trump one percentage point extra that he wouldn't have had if Kennedy was still running, that matters in these swing states. Could matter. That's interesting. I want to also ask about some of the other third party and independent candidates. So now we've seen RFK Jr. drop out and throw his support behind Trump, but there's still the libertarian Chase Oliver, the Green Party candidate Jill Stein, and independent Cornell West, who are out there and running campaigns. What do we know about how each of them, each of these candidates, could impact the race? So it's really interesting because Kennedy's exit from the race, in addition to getting rid of a candidate who was pulling more votes from Trump, leaves three pretty left-leaning independent and third-party candidates as remaining in the race. These candidates get pretty small shares of the vote. They're usually around 1% or less, so not anywhere near what Kennedy was pulling. But two of them, Stein and West, are clearly to the left of Kamala Harris. I think libertarian Chase Oliver is a bit more of a wild card. You know, the, the libertarian party tends to span the right and left a little bit more. It's not clear that they're pulling from the left or the right. But it does create a circumstance in which we have these three candidates who are left-leaning, and these small margins can matter. The, the decisive states in 2016 and 2020 were decided by less than one percentage point. So if you have three candidates who have this appeal to, you know, left-leaning Americans and pull half a percentage point each or one percent in some cases, you know, mm -hmm. uh, it, it could wind up mattering in these states. And so we are seeing the Harris campaign be concerned about this. We are seeing fights over ballot access for these candidates that are really raging pretty hard right now. Yeah, I wanted to ask about that, too, because I'm not even sure where these candidates will be on the ballot. Do we know how many states they could potentially be in play? This is a big point of emphasis for any potential spoiler impact that these candidates could have. Oliver is going to be on the ballot in the vast majority of states because the Libertarian Party has done well enough to make that the case. It's more difficult with Stein and with West. The Green Party doesn't have automatic ballot qualification in as many states as Libertarians. So we've seen Jill Stein qualify in about half of swing states so far. We just learned on Monday that she will remain on the Wisconsin ballot because the state Supreme Court declined to take up a challenge to that. West will probably be on fewer ballots. Uh, Republicans are, are trying to salvage his spot on the ballot in Arizona right now because they think he would hurt Kamala Harris. He was recently cleared for North Carolina's ballot, but a lot of these other swing states are very much up in the air. So this matters greatly. You know, whether these candidates are on the ballot in the swing states, especially Stein and West, is going to determine whether these left-leaning voters have this other option if they are somewhat disillusioned with Harris. And so I think in the days and weeks ahead, you're going to hear a lot about these, these ballot access battles because they do matter. That's interesting. It sounds like it's still very much an open question about how big of an impact they'll have. Yeah, and this is, you know, if, if Jill Stein and Cornell West are not on the ballot in you know, some of these swing states, that just takes the option away. It, it kind of eliminates the spoiler effect to some extent. But I, I think it's also important to note that, you know, just because a candidate is further to the left of Harris, which Stein and West obviously are, that doesn't necessarily mean you can just take their votes and, mm -hmm. you know, assume that if they're not in the race, they'll go to the more left-leaning candidate, that they'll go to Harris. A lot of people did this in the 2016 election after Hillary Clinton lost. You know, they were searching for reasons why Clinton lost. And so they zeroed in on 
Jill Stein and the fact that she took more votes than right, right. I remember. Clinton's margin of defeat Yeah, in several of these states. And I think it really went beyond the evidence, though. A lot of these are third party voters who like to vote third party and generally do that. A lot of them are people who probably wouldn't have voted for Hillary Clinton anyway. So you can't just assume that all these votes would transfer directly if these candidates are not on the ballot. Yeah, that makes sense. And and I'm curious, just sort of really big picture now that we've talked about Kennedy and Stein and West and, and have looked back in time. I'm curious how we should think about third party votes and third party candidates right now. Because it seems like, you know, at a different point in this cycle, we were looking at a, a very strong uh, showing for for Kennedy, at least. And now we're talking again about, OK, maybe one percent here, one percent there. These these sort of very small bites in the margins. Yeah, it has been a remarkable turnabout. In some ways, this is just a reflection of our system and how it drives voters to the major party candidates because those are the ones that ultimately have a chance to win. Mm. If you look at how third-party candidates poll over time in almost every election, they poll better than they ultimately perform on election day. And that's because voters want to vote for somebody who has a chance to win. They want to vote between the two candidates who are in contention. But this was a real opportunity for third-party candidates to get a significant chunk of the vote. You know, if Robert F. Kennedy Jr. wound up getting 5% of the vote somehow— that would have shown that there is kind of an appetite for these independent third-party candidates. And now that he's out of the race, we're not going to see that. All indications are that we're not going to have a significant third-party independent vote. It's not going to be a situation Mm -hmm. like we were confronting where this disillusionment with the two major party candidates, Trump and Biden, paved the way for these third-party and independent candidates to have kind of a historic showing. Aaron, this is so helpful for understanding what's what's going on with the third party candidates that we don't get a chance to talk about that much. I mean, I, I'm somebody who's always been fascinated by the third party dynamics and the, the 2024 election has been so remarkable in that in that way. And so I think it's something that certainly we're going to keep confronting in future elections, but it's not done for this election either, because there is a real question about how much these candidates are going to pull, especially from Kamala Harris, on November 5th. That is election day. But I think that's all we have time for today. So thanks so much for chatting with me. And thank you, Laura. Laura Benchoff is a politics producer for audio at The Post. And I'm Aaron Blake, senior political reporter. If you want more original, deep analysis of campaign news, make sure that you're subscribing to my newsletter, also called The Campaign Woman. You can find a link in our show notes and at postreports.com. And if you don't already, make sure that you're subscribing to the Campaign Moment podcast feed for more great episodes like this one. Find us wherever you listen. And if you're enjoying the show, make sure you tell a friend who would like it and give us a rating and review. Today's episode was produced by Laura Benchoff and mixed by Renny Svernovsky. It was edited by Lucy Perkins and Jenna Johnson. We'll see you later this week. Bye. Bye.